So, so uh, he's now, I, I should call, uh, may, may, I wanted to make a special mention of that here. Okay, so, um, so what's the concept? So this is a concept of sprawl, which was defined by Duchin, Leliev, and Moon, Mooney. So the idea is as follows. You take a metric space X and fix a base point in, in your metric space. And imagine you have a, a family of probability measures supported on spheres centered at X with radius R. So you have mu R, which is a, there is a family of probability measures supported on spheres. So you define this quantity uh, E, which depends a priori on the base point and the measure, which is simply the limit of one over R, the distance between pairs of points on your sphere integrated with respect to this measure. So what does this mean? What is E, e, e this quantity E, which is the sprawl measuring? It's kind of measuring the normalized average distance between pairs of uh, points on spheres, on large spheres as the radius goes to infinity. Okay, so that's the, that's the picture. The picture is you, you're taking larger and larger spheres and then, then taking pairs of points and trying to ask what, what is that distance between sort of the average, the average distance between these points. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the, that's the uh, quantity uh, which is being studied. So what are the properties of, of sprawl? Um, so clearly, because we are normalizing by the radius, uh, and the distance between any two points can at most be 2R, the, the sprawl is bounded above by 2. Uh, it is also base point dependent, uh, just from the definition, your spheres are based at a, at a particular base point. It is actually not a quasi-isometry invariant, uh, which actually makes it interesting. So it is something which is uh, kind of uh, uh, depends on, for example, later on when we'll see, when we look at Cayley graphs, it depends on, on generating sets and so on. Um, and it was also dependent on the family of measures. So my talk uh, here will later on focus on what happens when you pass to a different family of measures than the one that's usually studied for type Okay, uh, uh, so is the concept of sprawl clear uh, to everyone? Are there any questions? Okay, uh, so statistical hyperbolicity. So we say a space is statistically hyperbolic if the sprawl is base point independent and is equal to two. So equal to two means that if I have a sphere, a large sphere, and if I'm looking at pairs of points in this, then the, uh, then the, uh, the path between those points, I mean, if, you were, if this was geodesic space, would actually pass through the base point. So for most points, you have to come really close to the base point before you can connect up, which is kind of the behavior you're observing statistic in hyperbolic spaces, Hence, this concept of statistically hyperbolic. So it's hyperbolic on average. Uh, if your space is not homogeneous, then uh, then this doesn't. Uh, the base point independence is first of all hard to uh, to uh, maybe achieve. And what am I doing here? Uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, the the base point independence might be hard to achieve, and also. Uh, it is then possible to construct easy counterexamples of, of Gromo hyperbolic spaces, uh, which are not statistically hyperbolic. So, so, uh, so you might have a space, you do have thin triangles. However, you're not statistically hyperbolic because the, the measure is kind of messing things up. So for example, you could take a four regular tree and then you could pick an axis along the four regular tree and in the direction of the axis, you kind of go out and, and increase the, uh, the branching along that axis. So you add more and more vertices and edges kind of branching out more and more as you go along the axis. And then what will happen is that, that the contribution to the counting measure of these points will increase along this axis. So the counting measure is not kind of uniform anymore and it's, more, uh, it's denser near this, uh, this axis. But the, the paths that join various points will be small because you kind of went along an axis to add these extra branches. So your distance is actually not, is strictly less than two, even though you're still in a tree and bromo hyperbolic. Okay, so um, of course, so we want some homogeneity, so that's why we have to use the concept of Cayley graphs. So I think most uh, members of the audience here would know what a Cayley graph is, but I'll just quickly, uh, uh, include a quick definition for, uh, for, for completion. 
So a finitely generated group, I fix a symmetric generating set uh, A, and the Cayley graph of the group with respect to A, the, uh, the vertices of this graph are group elements, and you have an edge between G and H. If a group element G is obtained from, a group, from the group element H by right multiplication by a generator. Uh, so, for example, here is a Cayley graph of Z plus Z with respect to a standard generating set A and B. So you can see that the group elements are uh, are uh, in uh, sorry the vertices are in bijection with the group elements, and you you're connecting by the standard generators. And similarly, here is a Cayley graph of F two. So don't you? And does anyone have a guess for the third picture? What is this the Cayley graph of? Anyone know, uh, wants to take a guess? Sol? Heisenberg group? Yeah, it is the Heisenberg group. This is the Cayley graph of the Heisenberg group. OK, so, so we have these spaces now. And now, being, being the Cayley graph of a group, this is now a homogeneous space. Uh, uh, the local geometry around a vertex is the same at every point. Uh, so this has the advantage now that we that our sprawl, our definition of sprawl, which was up here, is now completely independent of the base point. So now we can talk about statistical hyperbolicity of of KD graphs. And so here are some of the known results. Um, so the measure that we want to use now inside a Cayley graph is the counting measure on the sphere. So if you take uh, all group elements whose word length is R, this is a finite list because you have finitely many generators, and uh, uh, this finite list, we can put the counting measure, probability measure on this finite list of group elements. And then uh, you can compute its sprawl. And so Dushin, Leliev, and Mooney showed that uh, if you take the group Z to the D, the free abelian group of rank D, and for any finite symmetric generating set for this group, the sprawl is less than two. So Z to the D is honestly not statistically hyperbolic. Uh, which is kind of what one expects. This is a uh, this is a abelian group. It should is a, definitely has fat triangles, etc. Um, but it's quite interesting. I mean, I won't want, don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's quite interesting that as you change your generating set, this quantity e can be made as close to two as you want. So so depending on the rank and a, I think you can get as close to uh, close to two as you want. Okay, and they also proved that uh, if you go to the other side, which is to take a Gromo hyperbolic group, uh, then the Cayley graph of the Gromo hyperbolic group is actually statistically hyperbolic for any generating set, which is kind of satisfying. So we know that uh, Gromo hyperbolic certainly implies statistically hyperbolic. But it turns out that the converse is not true, that you can have statistically hyperbolic spaces, which are in fact homogeneous, they are Cayley graphs of groups. But they are not Gromo hyperbolic. So, a standard example here is the free group cross, uh, it's, uh, is the direct product free group cross Z. And here, what happens is the following. So, how should one think of the Cayley graph of free, the free group cross Z? So, it's like um, uh, infinitely many sheets of the four valence valent trees, right? So, for each value of Z, if you go in the F2 direction, you have a, uh, you have a four valent tree. And then the point is that, so you have, you know, you have sheets of four regular tree. And now if you take uh, the, uh, if you try to take a sphere of radius R, what happens is that uh, the, the sheets close to zero contribute the most, zero in Z contribute the most. And as a result, the sprawl comes out to be two. So you kind of like, if you take the sphere of radius R, most of the points in the sphere are either in the zero sheet or one sheet or minus one sheet and so on. So they're mostly uh, clustered around a definite interval about zero in, in Z uh, and they become thinner and thinner as you go further out in the Z direction. As a result, you're doing most of your counting in the tree and your sprawl comes out to be true. Okay, so there are examples of Gromo hyper, there are examples of groups which are not Gromo hyperbolic, but which can still be statistically hyperbolic. 
Okay, and then further along in this direction, Osborne and Yang showed that relatively hyperbolic groups are also statistically hyperbolic for any finite generating set. So one has to be, uh, one has to basically a little bit expand a little bit on what exact definition of relative hyperbolicity one is using here, but kind of, again, things turn out as you expect. Okay, so from, from um, uh, sort of the homogeneous situation, one wants to pass now to slightly inhomogeneous situations where the, the sprawl is still base point independent. So you want to go from here, we know for Cayley graphs it's homogeneous, so the sprawl is, is on the nose base point independent. So one wants to pass to spaces where this could still be true even though the space is not uh, homogeneous. And so the first example one tries when one wants to do work in, homo in homogeneous space is, is a Tychmuller space. So what's a Tychmuller space? Um, so S be an oriented surface of finite type. So what I mean by is a surface with, uh, uh, so, so finite type here means uh, the genus of the surface is finite and number of mark points is finite. Okay, and in this, uh, so um, the, for such a surface, uh, if the Euler characteristic, characteristic of the surface is negative, then it's covered by the unit disk. And, but anyway, independent of that, the Tychmuller space of S is defined to be the space of marked conformal structures on your surface. Uh, by uniformization in negative Euler characteristic, this also is the space of marked hyperbolic matrix. Hyperbolic metrics. The reason I put this is that it now gives me a chance to draw a nice picture. So the, at the mark points, you could have this hyperbolic cusp, and then there's some genus in some compact form. So these 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 here are like the hyperbolic cusp neighborhoods, and in the compact part, there's some topology. Um, so this is. This, this kind of thick thin decomposition will also be later on useful in the mo in modelized spaces, hence I, I wanted to draw this picture. Okay, so all possible, hyper so one way to think about this is all possible uh, uh, metrics I can, uh, hyperbolic metrics that I can e equip my surface S with so that the surface S has cusps at these mark points. Uh, the mapping class group of your surface S is the, is the group of orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of your surface modulo isotopies. And the modulized space of Riemann surfaces is, is, uh, is the Tychmuller space with the action of the, of the mapping class group by changing the marking. So you have a marked surface, so you're kind of remembering curves on the surface. And um, a marked hyperbolic surface will be a hyperbolic surface along with the, uh, the list of curves, like along with names for the curves. And when the mapping class group acts on it, you get to forget the names of the curves. Okay, so um, this space, Tychmuller space is important from many, many points of views. Uh, it also carries a, a host of metrics. The metric that I want to uh, talk about here is the Tychmuller metric. So the Tychmuller metric on, on a Tychmuller space is basically, it, 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 it has the following uh, structure. It comes from a classical theorem of Tychmuller, which says the following. So if you have two, Mark conformal structures is mark conformal structures. Then X actually can be equipped with what is called a flat structure. So the picture I get to draw then is that your your surface X becomes like that, and now uh, it's a flat. It's a polygon with groupings. So let me make these markings here. So you have these um, equal and opposite sides, and then you get to glue them by translations or half translations, gluing. And then to get from it, so this will be, you see that the space, the surface has charts into the complex plane, because if I sit around a point, I get a small local chart into the complex plane. The transition functions, because the gluings are translations, are holomorphic. This defines a conformal structure on the surface. 
And now, um, if I want to go from the space so surface X to the surface Y, I get to uh, uh, to shrink the vertical and uh, stretch the horizontal. So the new surface looks something like this. And uh, now, excuse my drawing skills here. So it gets stretched in one direction, uh, in the horizontal direction, and uh, shrunk in the, uh, by the same factor in the vertical direction. And you notice that what were the, the, the gluings that were there before are continue to hold. So those sides which were equal and, uh, uh, and parallel, uh, sides which were parallel and equal in length continue to be that. So now you get gotten from, uh, from one mark conformal structure to another by this process. So the theorem says that given two mark conformal structures on a, re, on a surface S, there exists a flat structure on X, which means I can draw X in this kind of way. Sorry, I can draw X, I can, why won't this choose? I can draw X this way and then apply this stretch uh, and shrink map to get Y, okay? And that, it turns, this, this kind of quasi-conformal map turns out to be extremal in the sense that it actually minimizes the distortion required infinite symbol. Uh, and this quasi-conformal map is then used to define the Teichmuller matrix. The Teichmuller matrix between two mark conformal st uh, structures, X and Y, is defined as half of log of the, of the stretch factor for the extremal map, which is this kind of thing. Okay? So is the, is the definition of the Teichmuller matrix clear? Are there any questions? Okay. Um, so let me give, do an example. So let's do an exceptional moduli example. So let's look at the two torus. And if you, if you want to give the two torus a, a, a mark conformal structure, I should realize the two torus as some kind of complex object. So the way, the way to do that is to think of the two torus as the complex plane modulo a lattice. And we, remember, it's a mark thing, so I should remember the basis of the lattice and then the we, then up to by holomorphism, I can, I can arrange the lattice to be z times one direct some z times tau, where the, where the complex number tau is lives in the upper half plane. So any lattice that I, that, that I take, essentially I can, I can choose a basis for that lattice, then uh, choose an oriented basis for the lattice, then rotate the basis so that the first vector in the, in the basis points in the positive real direction, then scale the lattice down so that it looks like, like this. Okay, so and all of these operations that I'm doing, rotation and scaling, are biholomorphisms of symmetry. So they don't change the complex symmetry. So, so realizing a two torus as a mark conformal surface is to write it as C modulo this lattice. And remember there's only, so the point is that there's only one parameter here, which is the, this guy, tau with the condition imaginary part of tau bigger than zero. So the Teichmuller space of, uh, of a torus is just the upper half plane. Now we want to understand what is the mapping class group. So which means now I want to preserve the lattice, but I want to forget its marking. So I want to take the basis of the lattice, but I want to forget the basis. I just want to remember the lattice itself. So what should I do? I should try to come up with a map of the lattice, an isomorphism of the lattice, uh, sort, of, sort of allow myself all possible isomorphisms of the lattice. So if you have a lattice like that, the group of isomorphisms of the lattice naturally identifies with the group SL2Z. And hence the modular group SL2Z is the mapping class group of the doors. And the quotient is the, is the standard modular surface. This is the moduli space of tori. Okay, and uh, so this picture here, I borrowed from Cherita's uh, gallery. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the picture of a fundamental domain of, for, the, for, the, for the modular surface. Okay, uh, so um, for example, it's kind of obvious for here that, uh, that you know, this kind of element lives in SL2Z and that's when you write it as a Mobius transformation on the upper half plane, this becomes the Mobius transformation. Z goes to Z plus one, and you see this symmetry in this picture. That, that this picture uh, that's drawn 
in the upper half plane is symmetric with respect to the uh, 2z goes to z plus 1. Okay. Uh, and then there are other symmetries as well. All right. Uh, so is this example clear? Are there any questions? Okay. So now I will kind of, so I, I'll move on to the more general case and I'll tell you some properties of Teichmuller metric. So only in the exceptional moduli do you get that Teichmuller metric is homogeneous. You do not get homogeneity in non-exceptional moduli. So first of all, Teichmuller metric is actually mapping class group invariant because the way the metric was defined was using extremal quasi-conformal maps. And if I if I change the marking, it doesn't affect the the, uh, the stretch factor of the extremal quasi-conformal maps. So this is um, the Teichmuller metric is actually modus invariant, but it is inhomogeneous. And the way to in explain is in homogeneity is to kind of use this picture again of, of, um, of the surface, uh, hyperbolic surface that are, uh, that are drawn above. So remember this, you can also, if you're in the negative Euler characteristic, you can also think of these as hyperbolic uh, metrics on your surface. And then the, um, the, the, uh, the space of these metrics uh, admits a thick thin decomposition. So I could take a hyperbolic uh, surface and ask myself, are there any short curves on the surface? So here is an example of a hyperbolic surface which has an extremely short curve. Okay, so the thick thing decomposition of of the Teichmuller metric uh, is really uh, a, a, a marked hyperbolic surface X is thin. Well, I should say epsilon thin. Um, is uh, epsilon thin if uh, there exists a simple closed curve alpha such that its hyperbolic length in this structure of alpha is less than epsilon. Okay, so there you, you kind of get to decompose your uh, hyperbolic structures whether they admit they have a short curve in them or not. And it turns out that the type of, sorry, it turns out that the Teichmuller metric on the thick and thin parts look very different. The Teichmuller metric restricted to thick part, where, which means hyperbolic structures where the injectivity radius is large. On, this, uh, on these parts, the thick, uh, on, these thick, on these thick points, the uh, Teichmuller metric has a lot of negative curvature aspects to it. But in the thin parts, uh, the Teichmuller metric looks like a product metric. Uh, and this was proved by Minsky, 25 years ago, I think. Uh, uh, and so the, po the point is that this means that the type of space is not homogeneous because the geometry in the thick part looks locally around a point, a thick point looks very different from the geometry uh, around a thin point. Around the thin point, it, it has a product structure. So it looks uh, extremely non, it doesn't have any positive curvature. I mean, it almost looks like um, flat or, or in fact, there are examples where you can get positive curvatures phenomena happen. So this is uh, a, a space which is not homogeneous, not negatively curved in any reasonable sense. And still we want to then understand, well, what's the next best thing we can do? Can we say that, uh, can we try to study statistical hyperbolicity for type of spaces? And Dowdle, Duchin, and Mazur prove that for many, so remember, for to define sprawls, I need uh, some family of measures and it turns out that uh, I should go back up here. I, I kind of was careful to say that it is the diagonal part of the SL2R action. Never, let's not go into that, what that means, but it means is that the Teichmuller distance associated to Teichmuller distance, there's a natural flow called the Teichmuller flow. And um, uh, this Teichmuller flow has, an, has, a, has, a, has what is called a Liouville measure associated to it. And this is what I mean by this Lebesgue class measures. Measures which are measures on spheres which live in the class of the Liouville measure for the flow. And um, with respect to these many of these Lebesgue class measures, uh, Dowdle, Duchin, and Mazur showed that the Teichmuller space with the Teichmuller metric is statistically hyperbolic. And so the main theorem of this talk is is uh, so the theorem that we will that I will describe here 
what it does is, is it extends statistical hyperbolicity as above to uh, a class of measures which are singular that are, that are singular. So they're not in the Lebesgue class. Okay, and I will describe these measures in the next few slides. So is, is it clear what the, what the main kind of goal of, uh, of the talk is? It's to show, it's to explain to you how uh, statistical hyperbolicity of uh, triangular space holds in, a, in for a much larger class of measures uh, than what Dowdle Ducci measure initially did. So the, the measures that I'm going to talk about arise from, from random walks on mapping class groups. So let me quickly give you a, uh, quick explanation of, of, of random walks in groups. So how does one generate a random walk on a finite, on, on a group? So you take a probability distribution on the group, and then you start producing random products with, for this probability distribution. So what you do is, in the first step, you sample a group element by this probability distribution. So that gives you the first group element, G1. Then you, you clean up the slate and you do a, a new sampling completely independent of the first sampling, again, using the same distribution mu, you get a group element G2, and then you multiply G1 on the right by G2. And then you keep going, and this is what is meant by a random walk on the group. It's a random product in the group uh, created by this particular scheme. So the, the pictures I've shown here are not actually of random walks on some kind of uh, discrete group or countable group. I wanted to sort of show, tell you why this is interesting. So for example, you could take, instead of taking a random walk on some kind of lattice in SL2R, you could directly take a random, uh, Brownian motion on SL2R. And so instead of sampling by, uh, sampling sort of discrete elements, what I'm doing is I'm sampling, uh, I have a more spread out distribution on SL2R and I'm sampling with respect to that. So again, I'm creating a random, matrix product. I have matrices in uh, uh, two cross two matrices with real entries determinant one. And I'm kind of create multiplying them at random to see what happens. And then what happens is that as you take a matrix in SL2R and you create a product like this, uh, it gives you a matrix which has uh, 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 real eigenvalues. One eigenvalue is bigger than one, and the other one is, a, is it's a determinant one, so it has to be its reciprocal. So your eigenvalues kind of, you get uh, uh, one bigger than one, and the other one is of course smaller than one. And also the eigen directions kind of tell you which direction in the hyperbolic plane you're moving. So if I think of the hyperbolic plane as, uh, uh, if you think of H as um, uh, SL2R, modulo the compact part SO2R, then what you see inside here is that the uh, eigen directions of, of, your, of your matrix are going to pick a direction uh, in, in H to move towards. So these pictures that you see here are Brownian motion and you can see from the picture that the Brownian motion kind of lingers around, but eventually kind of heads off in, in some direction. Now, the, another way to see, sort of explain this is imagine you're trying to do Brownian motion in the hyperbolic plane, and let's suppose you make progress in a particular direction. So now it's hyperbolic geometry, so looking forward in your visual sphere, your forward direction has more probability than, than the direction that you came from. So if, for example, if I were to draw this picture like this, and if I were to say, well, here's my random walk, it made progress in that direction, then the half space over here and the half space over there, the, the forward half space has much more measure, much more likelihood of, of being achieved than the, than, the, than the backward half space. As a result, you, your, your random work kind of con tries to con continues to move forward and eventually has convergence to, the, to infinity. And you kind of see that in this picture. Roughly speaking, they're kind of heading off, they're wandering around, but they're, they're heading off in a particular direction, making all this sort of progress forward. Okay, um, so I mean, I think a Brownian motion is just the, a, a, I can draw a, a good pictures and B, I can, you can sort of see those pictures nicely. Um, 
Okay, so instead of Brownian motion, well, what we want to do is essentially do it on some lattices in SL2. So, so if you have a lattice in SL2, you pick set of generators for the lattice and you just put your probability measure on the lattice and ask yourself whether some picture like this holds. And the answer is yes. So instead of discretizing, instead of taking Brownian motion, if I take sight of a discrete version of, of the Brownian motion, which is a random walk on a lattice, it has the same properties. A typical random walk kind of starts heading out in some direction and converges to a point at infinity, which is a which is the boundary circle. So I want I want to talk a little bit more about this example SL two Z. So um, I just wanted to say here in this picture with uh, with which I where I showed the fundamental domains from SL two Z. You can actually make SL two Z to be quasi isometric to this dual tree. So there is a tree here. So this is what is called a ferret tessellation, ferret triangulation, tessellation. And dual to that, you can see this trivalent tree, right? There's a tree here. So there's a trivalent tree. And uh, I wanted to use this example to illustrate a little bit about what happens with the random walks and also the corresponding stationary measures that you get on, on the circle. So, as I said, a random walk drifts out to infinity, converges to a point on the boundary. So you could then give a measure on the boundary as follows. So if you want to measure the size of a set on the boundary, you should ask, what is the probability that my sample, my random walk converges to a point inside this set? So you get random walks give convergence to S1. This convergence to S1 gives you uh, what is called a stationary measure on infinity, which is H of A is simply the probability of uh, a, sa a sample path to converge to into A. Um, and so let's now consider an example of SL2Z. I'm taking the standard generators here, which is R, which is one, one, one. So these parabolic generators, one, one, zero, one. And let's try and understand what, how you can think of this generators in the Farragraph picture. So let me give some names here. This is zero, this is one. Let's imagine we start at, uh, at this point here, or, or even maybe at this point here. This is our base point. And then going left is here, remember left is, uh, L is one, one, zero, one, which as a Mobius transformation looks like Z goes to Z plus one. And going right is down here. And then we can keep going further, right? So you have like, in the, in the tree, it becomes like whether you're doing rights or lefts in the tree. So in the trivalent tree, going forward, rights or lefts gives you a sample path. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking, sorry, excuse me. Uh, what I'm doing here is, I'm putting equal weights on rights and lefts. So let's say we have a coin, which is heads. If it's heads, we go right. If it's tails, we, we go left. And then I generate a random walk using this probability distribution. So it's going to look like some kind of sequence where you do, a, do rights A1 number of times, lefts A2 number of times, rights A3 number of times, lefts. So you alternate between rights and lefts infinitely often and produce, that produces a sample path that produces a path in this in this uh, in this uh, trivalent tree this path in this in the trivalent tree actually converges to a point at infinity and it turns out these that these coefficients here these numbers here are exactly the continued fraction coefficients of of of, of the number that you converge to so what you converge to at infinity has this uh, as the continued fraction expansion and so on. Okay, um, so now you could ask, well, okay, what is the probability that, uh, we can ask what is the probability that uh, we converge that omega converges into say the interval zero to one over n. And the answer is that, well, for it to converge into the interval zero to one over n, the first coefficient has got to be n. Uh, 
A1 has got to be N. So which means, or at least N. So which means that our, 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 our coin should turn up heads at least N times before it does anything else. So this is exponentially unlikely because we're requiring that it be, as I, as I keep tossing my coin, it will be requiring that it, it should be heads uh, the first N instances of the coin toss. Okay, um, but on the other hand, the Lebesgue measure of this interval is one over N. So you see on the one hand, the Lebesgue measure has like a polynomial decay and uh, the sample, the, the stationary measure, the measure that you get by, uh, in terms of convergence to infinity, this has uh, measure one over two to the N in the stationary measure at infinity. So there's a big discrepancy between the two measures. One measure is kind of decaying exponentially with, with, uh, with sort of, in terms of fixing an extra symbol. So if you fix R n times, that's like fixing a symbol in, uh, fixing some kind of cylinder set in your sample path. We're, we're, we're prescribing a prefix of your sample path and we're we are showing here that uh, if you fix a prefix of length n, then you're, uh, then you're um, uh, stationary measure at infinity has an exponential decay in the size of the prefix. On the other hand, uh, because they were parabolic elements, these generators, the Lebesgue measure is very, uh, uh, it's much um, uh, fatter near these points. So it's, it's only one over n. You don't dec decay as fast. As a, as a result, it turns out you can promote this argument to show that the stationary measure at infinity is, is actually singular with respect to the Lebesgue measure because of this, this discrepancy that I just explained. Okay, and what I showed here as a, a, in one example in a very special case actually persists in general, and it turns out that if you take any uh, non-uniform lattice, so by non-uniform I mean, uh, I should explain this word here. So non-uniform means a gamma is a non-uniform lattice in SL2R, if the quotient, uh, if volume of H mod gamma is finite, but H mod gamma is not compact. Which really means a surface like that. Surface or before like this, like the one we were drawing, like this one. Okay, so, um, if you have a random, so the theorem is that if you have a random walk on a lattice, uh, or on a non-uniform lattice, which means it contains parabolic isometries of the hyperbolic plane, then uh, any stationary measure that you get from some reason, from a reasonable random walk on this lattice is singular with respect to the Lebesgue measure on, on the circle. Okay, so one could then ask, well, it does, since we are trying, this SL2Z was a prototype of a mapping class group, what happens when you try to do this for mapping class groups? So first of all, we want to understand what happens to random box on the mapping class group. And secondly, once we understand that, we want to know what happens to the stationary measures that arise from random box on the mapping class group. So uh, this goes back to the work of Kaimanovich and Mazur in 96. Uh, what they showed is that if you do the same process, you put a probability distribution on the mapping class group and use that to generate a sample path, then you can use the action of the mapping class group on the Tychmuller space to project this sample path into Tychmuller space. So now you have, you're generating sort of a random mapping class, and then you're fixing a base point in Tychmuller space, and you're actually applying your random mapping class to this base point to see where you go. And it turns out that as you, increase the size of the random walk, typically this base point will start marching off in some direction and actually converge to some reasonable boundary of Tychmuller space. And this boundary is what is called the Thurston boundary of Tychmuller space. And I won't go into too much, too much details of what this Thurston boundary is. Um, basically, points in this boundary are projective classes of measured foliations or if you prefer laminations, laminations on S. Uh, 
So each such projective class is a point of this boundary. And it turns out that your random walk, when you generate, a, uh, when you, you know, run your random walk for a really large uh, number, n number n, and you take the limit as n goes to infinity, a typical sample path actually kind of heads out towards infinity and converges to a point on the boundary. So this defines now a stationary measure on this space of projective measured foliations. And I remember I said earlier on that uh, there's a Lugal measure for the Teichmuller flow. And it turns out that the Lugal measure for the Teichmuller flow, if you try to push it off to the boundary, it actually gives you some kind of Lebesgue class on the, on, on, on the boundary of Teichmuller space. I, I, have to be, I have to make one quick remark here. It is not, oops, what happened here? Let's scroll down. Sorry. As you can see, I'm clearly struggling between the pen and the scrolling of, of, of the. Right. Okay. So it turns out that um, one thing that's uh, that happens for Teichmuller spaces, which is unlike the picture I was drawing before, is that uh, it is not true that e for every tangent vector that I draw the type of geodesic that you get converges nicely to the to infinity. So what, what could happen is that this type of geodesic, as it goes off to infinity, doesn't have good conversions. It doesn't, I mean, it shouldn't be converted. It might have a, the limit set of a type of geodesic at infinity could, be, could have a spread. It could be, it could look much larger than a single point. So this can happen, but this only happens for a measure zero set of directions in the Liouville measure. As a result, the Liouville measure for the flow can be pushed off to the boundary at infinity to give a Lebesgue measure class at infinity. Okay, so now you can do the same thing. You can take the stationary measure for the, for the random walk and compare it to the Lebesgue measure at infinity and ask whether, whether they, are, they are absolutely continuous or singular with respect to each other. And we showed a, uh, for, a, for a smaller class of random walks first, in uh, and then with Joseph Maher and Julio Teozzo for a much larger class of random walks, that the stationary measure at infinity is actually singular. Okay, so now we can then, uh, re we, now we have a setup to rephrase statistical hyperbolicity for this new class of measures. So what's happening here is the following, we have the following picture. We still have, our this is Teichmuller space, here is the Thurston boundary. And we can sit at the base point. And remember, I said that the set of directions that don't have good convergence is measure zero. It turns out this is also measure zero for the stationary measure. So the set of bad directions has measure zero in both those measures, even though they're singular. So what I get to do now is there's this measure at infinity, and I get to pull that measure back to the unit tangent bundle at this point. So you know, I can take the unit tangent, so I can look at T1 uh, uh, or at the point X, at this point X, to Teichmuller space. And I can pull back the measure from infinity to the T1 uh, at this ball, and then I can push it out onto spheres of radius R. That way we get now a family of measures on spheres of radius R. So is this clear how I'm getting a class of measures on the spheres of radius R? This is, I mean, so there are three steps here. One is that you have this measure at, at infinity, uh, the set of bad directions where you don't have good conversions of your type Miller geodesics to infinity is measure zero even for this new um, uh, stationary measure. I know it's a singular, but it still has the measure, uh, z measure zero in this new measure. So you can pull the whole measure off from infinity to, uh, to the unit ball at a point. And once you have a measure on the unit ball at a point, you can now push that measure out to spheres of radius R. So that way we have a class of probability measures on spheres of radius R. And so what we showed with uh, Azemar and Jeffries was that for this measure, so these measures are now singular with respect to the Lebesgue class. So it's not covered by the dowdell duchin mazur theorem. But what we showed is that even for these measures, the Teichmuller space is statistically hyperbolic. Okay, and now I should say in recent, very recent work, Eskin, Mirzakhani, and Rafi showed that one can solve the re reverse problem, the what is called the Fustenberg problem, which is that one could ask, is there a, a random walk on the mapping class group 
whose stationary measure at infinity is actually not singular, but absolutely continuous. And they are answered in the affirmative. There exists a, ra a, a, a random walk on the mapping class group, which gives you absolute continuous measures at infinity. So the, or the theorem that we prove in, uh, is general enough to include both the Lebesgue and the singular cases. OK. Uh, are there any questions? OK. Um, so let me now quickly go to the proofs of uh, how am I doing on time, I guess. Uh, I have 12 minutes. Is that uh, reasonable? Uh, yep, 12 minutes if you okay. wish to use it. Yeah, OK. So I will quickly try to outline how the proof of this goes. So the proof. This the strategy of the proof is the same as in Dowdle, Duchin, Mazur. Uh, the idea is the following. So for step one, we want to show, so remember, uh, the setup is that we have our space, we have our base point, and we are taking pairs of points on spheres, right? So what we want to do first is to show that if you take a pair of geodesic rays, they actually spread apart nicely. So then the first case you want to sort of start off, uh, the first thing you want to prove is that a typical pair actually has good separation. They do not fellow travel. The geodesics kind of go further and further apart. And then in the second step, what you want to do is, okay, so now we are both, we have these two points at distance r. In the second step, what you want to do is you want to show that the geodesic that connects this point to that one actually uh, has to backtrack a lot of the first geodesic and then go forward in the second year. So it's not exactly thin triangles because the backtracking is only kind of a linear proportion of the of, of R, not really all the way back to, I mean, if this was a delta hyperbolic space, your, your geodesic in blue would actually kind of come all the way back to a fixed neighborhood of the base point. This is not a delta hyperbolic space, but what you want is you definitely still force enough backtracking for the statistical hyperbolicity to work out. Does that make sense, the strategy? So you show that typical pairs of directions actually spread apart quite a bit. And once they spread apart enough, if you try to join their endpoints, you have to backtrack quite close to the base point and then go out. So that's the strategy to, to show that, uh, uh, that the space type is a hyperbolic, uh, statistically hyperbolic. Okay, so, so how do we do this? So, it turns out to have good fellow traveling properties of tight nullar geodesics, um, one needs to use the thickness. I, I mentioned up here that, that uh, uh, the thick part of tight nullar space has negative curvature aspects. So it turns out that if we know it turns out the following. It turns out that you see the, the, the two rays here. So this is gamma and gamma prime. So if it turns out if we know something about how much time, what proportion of time, so sorry. If uh, gamma and gamma prime spend a definite proportion, I mean, I'm simplifying here. This is not exactly what the statement is. Portion in the thick part, Then I get to then we get this picture. Then we get to achieve this picture. Okay, so now the step two roughly then translates into showing how, uh, showing something about how uh, some quantitative statement about how much time gamma and gamma prime spend in the thick part. In case of the in case of the Lebesgue class measures, this follows from the ergodicity of the Teichmuller flow. So what are we asking? We are asking somehow recurrence of or the two geodesic rays to some some chunk of uh, of Teichmuller space, and if you knew that your flow was ergodic, then you would know this uh, this fact that they have to spend a definite proportion of the time in the uh, in 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 the thick part. So we want to kind of mimic that ergod ergodicity in the random walk setup. We don't have the flow here. We we have a different like a, we have a singular measure, and we want to achieve somehow a similar um, similar statement. So this kind of follows from the following idea. So 
again, let me draw a kind of a schematic picture. Here is type into space. Here is my base point. And now I, I will choose instead of just the forward random walk, I will choose a bi infinite random walk, uh, both forward and backward. So I will take the probability distribution. If it's uh, not symmetric, so the, I will. Uh, I will just kind of invert it. So the probability of, I'll set the probability of going backwards of, uh, of, uh, of for the backward random walk to be equal to is the reflected measure. You just reflect that measure in, uh, in terms of the inverse. So, okay, so now you have some forward random walk and you have some backward random walk. And now it turns out, well, okay, so we have good convergence to infinity. So I can try and consider this by infinite Jurassic ray. Okay, and now the point is that what Kaimanovich and Mazur showed is that this random walk, while it kind of does wander around, it returns to a fixed neighborhood of this geodesic ray. So there will I can draw like this standard picture in hyperbolic geometry. I can find a neighborhood of the geodesic ray so that the sample path recurs to this neighborhood infinitely often. It keeps coming back to this neighborhood. Uh, recursively right? it keeps coming back uh, with a definite so if you look at the uh, at the uh, if you look at the number of steps which come back into this green neighborhood that has a definite asymptotic proportion in terms of n okay so how does that help thickness now here is the point if this base point is already thick then the entire sample path, so if then so the omega n of x is also thick. Because remember, uh, uh, the mapping class group only changes the marking. It doesn't really change the hyperbolic geometry. So if the hyperbolic geometry was initially thick, all the cur all curves had definite lengths, like lengths bigger than epsilon, then when you apply the mapping class to it, it still remains true. So your entire sample path now lives in the thick part and you want to force the geodesic in blue to be also spending a definite proportion in the thick part. Here is where, and here is where the recurrence helps. So your sample path is recurring to a neighborhood of the geodesic, but remember the sample path is thick. So the part of the geodesic, which is close to the sample path is now become thick. And now this has to be kind of quantitatively souped up to give the exact quantitative version that of thickness that one wants. So what one does is there are two things that you get to use. One is that sample paths kind of recur to these neighborhoods and also make linear progress. So if I spend a million steps of the sample path, you are def make, de making definite linear progress in type inverse space. So you kind of head out in, in that direction. At the same time, you kind of dip into this green neighborhood infinitely uh, quite, quite a lot with a definite proportion of the number of steps. And as, a, as a result, this blue, this blue geodesic from the closest point onto a certain point this blue geodesic will accrue enough amount of thickness. And then you promote this into a careful quantitative, uh, quantitative uh, um, argument that will be essentially the step two in Dowdle Luchin Maze. Okay, so now what remains is to understand, keep messing this up, sorry. Now what remains is to understand why step one is two. And this is where we get, so step one, let me remind you, step one says we want to know that typical, we want to know that typical uh, rays for your measure, they actually kind of diverge nicely. So uh, for this, what we do is we use a different space for the action of the mapping class group, which is called the complex of curves. So the idea is that, um, so, okay, so what is the complex of curves? The complex of curves is a graph where vertices of your, uh, uh, where the vertices are given by isotopic classes of simple closed curves, and there's an edge every time two curves can be made to be disjoint. So for example, let's draw a quick picture. Um, let me just draw a few curves. Um, 
Okay, so, um, <clears throat> and then finally, maybe this code here. So you have, um, I guess I should call them names. So you have alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And um, so delta is disjoint from all three. So in your graph, you will have a single vertex where delta is connected to everything. Okay, and then alpha and gamma are disjoint. So uh, if you have alpha here, gamma here, and beta here, alpha and gamma are disjoint, so you have an edge there. And beta intersects alpha and gamma, so beta has no edges, uh, other edges. So that's some piece of the com complex of curves that I've drawn here. So the complex of curves is an inf, so this is an infinite, uh, locally infinite graph. You see the link of every curve itself is very large because if you take a curve and you cut open the surface along that curve, you still have some topology left so you can fix, fit in a lot of simple closed curves in the resulting cut open surface. So uh, a single vertex is disjoint from infinitely many other vertices. So the local uh, link of a, of a vertex is actually infinite. So this is a locally infinite graph, but it also has infinite diameter, which is a little bit uh, more subtle to see. So uh, Mazur and Minsky in their, uh, in their seminal work showed that the complex of scores is actually a, a with the path metric uh, coming from it, its graph structure is actually a delta hyperbolic space. They, moreover, they also showed that, so here is another way to think of the complex of curves uh, uh, in terms of the thick thin decomposition of type Miller space. So I remember up here I said, um, where is that gone? Yeah, uh, uh, so uh, the thick thin decomposition comes from the fact, so what are the thin parts of type Miller space? Some simple closed curve is, uh, is, uh, is short. So what I will do is I will cook up a map from type Miller space to the complex of curves where you send a point X to the systole of X. So systole is the shortest curve on that Mark hyperbolic surface. So this gives you a map from type Miller space to the complex of curves. And in some sense, uh, uh, I, I mean, they can be more precise about this if you want later is that the curve complex is actually an electrification of type Miller space along these thin parts. So you take the type Miller space, it's not delta hyperbolic at all. You have these thin parts and what are the obstructions to being delta hyperbolic? Exactly these thin parts, parts because they carry a product structure. And then if you electrify these thin parts, what you get is actually delta hyperbolic. And it's actually, it's quasi isometric to the complex of course. Okay, so because of this electrification process that I just described, you can take a type Miller geodesic and project it under this electrification to the electrified type Miller space, so to, to the curve complex. Now, what it turns out is that the projection of a type Miller uh, uh, from type Miller space to the curve complex takes type Miller geodesics to unparameterized quasi geodesics. So, what happens is that the image of a type Miller geodesic looks like a geodesic but you might not be making good linear progress along it. So you're, you might be sort of dawdle, dawdling along this geodesic. So you might make some progress for a while, then sit around for a while, and then, then make progress again. So it's an unparameterized quasi geodesic, but what, I, what is important is that in this process, you never backtrack actually. So you make some progress, then you may, maybe you spend some time just around this point, and then you make progress again. Okay, and uh, if you're, and it turns out because of the way this thing was constructed, as I said, you, this is an electrification of type Miller space electrified along the thin part. Uh, if you have a thick type Miller geodesic segment, it actually makes linear progress in the complex of curves, makes definite progress. So now what do we want to show? We want to show that typical rays actually separate. So imagine you take two rays which are, which are fellow traveling in type Miller space. They don't not separating as much as we want. So you start off at your base point and you produce two rays which fellow travel. And remember these rays actually have a definite proportion of thickness along them. So you can then project these two rays into the curve complex and they will have made a definite progress in the curve complex. But the curve complex is actually gromohyperbolic uh, 
So they are kind of started at a point and, and, and nested into some kind of shadow or half space in your Bromo hypolysis. And now the next part of the proof, it just uses the fact that if you take the, the probability that your sample part converges into a shadow which is far away from the base point in the curve complex, this has very small probability. And this probability goes to zero as the shadows get further and further apart from the, away from the base point. As, as a result, what you you prove, you, you get the proof of this separation statement that you were looking for. The typical pairs of of rays actually do separate. Okay, uh, and then that's put together with a lot of other details, which I won't mention here. Uh, is the proof of of the statement? I should mention maybe two further directions. Uh, is Piotr in the talk? Maybe Piotr would have been interested in this. Okay, so the Maser Minsky machinery of hierarchies for the mapping class groups was uh, was sort of abstracted to more general spaces called hierarchically hyperbolic spaces. Uh, in an earlier slide, I mentioned that uh, if you have a relatively hyperbolic group, then you know that uh, uh, it's um, statistically hyperbolic. So then you could sort of ask this question for in general for other hierarchically hyperbolic spaces. So instead of relative hyperbolicity is now being replaced here by hierarch hierarchical hyper hyperbolicity of the space. And, uh, and then the question is, are hierarchically hyperbolic spaces statistically hyperbolic? And if they are under what conditions are there? Like, do you, does one need to imp impose extra hypothesis or not? Okay, so I think I will stop here and thank you for your time. Okay, well, uh, thank you for that. Are there any, any, any questions? I mean, I sort of had a, a vague one uh, relating to, okay. this, to, the, to the sprawl. I mean, okay. you, you mentioned that this was uh, sort of not a quasi-isometry invariant. Is there any yeah. sensible uh, equivalence relation sort of under which it is in, invariant? Um, I mean, in some sense, this uh, sprawl is constructed actually to study the shapes of ball. So it, it is explicitly kind of constructed to be not a quasi isometric. Okay. I mean, that's the advantage. Like, uh, what you want to do is ba ba basically, I think what um, Dushin, Leliev, and Mooney wanted to study was. Um, was like asymptotic shapes of balls. Okay. And even in sort of abelian examples, how do they change? Like we, uh, you know, we have, you know, changing the, the generators on even on Z to the T basically gives you, so you could take, uh, let's say you take a new set of generators in Z to the T and you can take its convex hull and that looks like a ball of radius one, right? The convex hull of, the generators of Z to the D looks like the ball of radius one uh, in Z to the D. And this could have an interesting shape. And they wanted to kind of study more directly this aspect, which quasi-isometry uh, is too flexible to allow you to study. So it was kind of explicitly constructed from trying to understand this and maybe for counting problems and so on and so forth. So, um, um, I mean, as a result, this is not a quasi-exometry invariant. So, for example, already this, the fact that this turns out to be two and base point independent in a non-homogeneous space like uh, Tychnilo space itself is an intriguing thing because uh, if it's non-homogeneous, it typically sprawl is, a, is, base point is base point dependent and then to for, for it to turn out to be not base point dependent and actually equal to two is, I think, the main sort of intriguing uh, thing, intriguing answer. Okay. Um, well, if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Vaibhav again. And, uh... Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to hear you talk.